Hi, and welcome to my presentation on hepatorenal syndrome. This is going to be a fairly brief presentation about how the liver, when it is um, damaged, or specifically when you have cirrhosis, how that affects other organs and specifically the kidney. So the first thing I wanted to do was explain a little bit about the blood vessels that are involved here that are not actually, um, these ones on the slide are not um, actually renal at all, but this is the, the real, real starting point that's going to cause the problem that we're going to see. So first of all, cirrhosis, if you're not familiar, that is when the liver has a lot of scar tissue building up from constant damage. It could be from alcoholism. It could be from um, hepatitis. It could be from fatty liver, from um, diet and things like that. But regardless, you get a lot of scar tissue formation, and that prevents the blood uh, from the portal vein from flowing um, easily through the liver. So then that pressure backs up into various organs. Um, these are the visceral abdominal organs, such as stomach, spleen, pancreas, um, small intestine, large intestine, which is also the colon. That backs up, and the problem with that is it generates a lot of pressure, number one, um, but just as important as that is the fact that you can't clear out the waste, um, which would be CO2 and things like that. You can't bring in new oxygen, so that creates a problem for all these organs. And I'm going to go ahead and show step-by-step uh, step here. First of all, blood backs up. Second of all, CO2 builds up. Lactic acid builds up. And oxygen is, is depleted. So what happens is these organs I consider, like most organs in the body, they try to protect themselves, not necessarily knowing or having um, any concern for what the other organs are doing in the body. So what happens is these organs here are going to open up the blood vessels that feed them. That would be the arteries like the celiac artery, superior mesenteric artery, and inferior mesenteric artery. Those arteries will open up to bring more blood through to try to uh, get in more oxygen and flush out the CO2 and the lactic acid and other things. The problem with that is you're bringing in more. Again, you're bringing in uh, through vasodilation, bringing in more th blood but there's nowhere really for it to go because it can't get through the liver. So what happens is you get a lot of, first of all, a lot of pressure building up here. It's really not helping these organs because you're not really getting much blood through them anyway, but you're building up pressure. And of course, that does create a lot of problems unrelated to the kidney, but we're not going to get into those right now um, in any great depth, at least, maybe just um, a little bit on the next slide or so. But um, what happens, though, is that when all this blood uh, comes through here, because all this vasodilation, all this blood comes through, and that kind of steals blood away from the rest of the body. And when that happens, you're actually creating a systemic uh, hypotension or low blood pressure. And that has some pretty significant effects on the kidney. So just a quick discussion here of... Uh, what actually can happen um, other than the renal problems or the kidney problems, some of the major things that can happen here when we do have that increased vasodilation in those arteries supplying the visceral abdominal organs that raises blood flow, that worsens portal hypertension. And this is pretty much for any vessel, the, the pressure in the blood vessel is equal to the blood flow times the resistance. So we're, we're putting more blood into all these organs but we are not letting it out. The resistance is astronomical because of all the scar tissue in the liver. Um, that can lead to uh, splenomegaly, splenomegaly, basically, where the spleen gets enlarged due to backing up of the blood. Um, the most common cause of death from cirrhosis would be esophageal bleeding. Okay, so that's basically going to be uh, varicose veins or varices that rupture and then they bleed. Um, so that those are some of the, the major things that can happen um, outside of, of the kidney dysfunction. But this all leads to hypotension, like I said, in the rest of the body. Um, even if we didn't have esophageal bleeding, we're pulling blood away from the systemic blood vessels. 
um, the systemic arteries other than the ones feeding the abdominal organs. So this leads us to the actual uh, discussion on the kidney. Some of you may be familiar with this already. This is a piece of, the, of a nephron. And just as a quick review, uh, there are about a million nephrons in each kidney. And the nephrons are really what's doing the majority of the work there. And that is um, really the filters. Those would be the filters in the kidney. This, so of course, these are microscopic. This is just the beginning of a nephron. The rest of it is, is not visible here, but you basically have this long tubule that's forming the urine. So we're going to do this in a stepwise manner to describe, um, remember that we have systemic hypotension. How does that affect blood flow into these uh, nephrons? So we have a little, um, little index card here with all the steps that I'm going to talk about, and then we'll go, we'll go through them one at a time. So the starting point is low renal artery pressure, right? That's the renal arteries are coming from the aorta, the abdominal aorta, and those have a lot of other tributaries and things that eventually turn into these microscopic afferent arterioles. Again, there's about a million of these in each kidney because there are a million glomeruli, et cetera, in, in nephrons. So they're all, they're all like pretty much equal ratio there. So the afferent arteriole, because um, the renal artery has low flow, the afferent arteriole then has low pressure and low flow. And what that does is that triggers these special cells called uh, renal juxtaglomerular cells or granular juxtaglomerular cells. These special cells are embedded really as part of the afferent arteriole. What's special about them is that they contain the enzyme called renin and renin is released uh, based on several different um, triggers, but the, the trigger that I want to focus on here because it's directly directly related to the blood pressure is the stretch the stretch receptor type of trigger. So in the afferent arterial, if it if the pressure is too low, that will reduce the stretch in the wall here, and that will trigger these granular juxtaglomerular cells to release renin, and that renin will circulate, okay, that'll circulate around the glomerulus. It'll not get filtered, or I mean, it won't go through the filter, so it'll just keep going to the efferent arterial, which eventually, that efferent arterial eventually will go back to the heart and then through the systemic bloodstream. So you'll have renin going around the whole body and in the lungs, in that lung blood supply, and eventually you'll you'll produce from renin, you'll you'll produce uh, the angiotensin two, and renin is the enzyme that um, converts angiotensin one, I'm sorry, angiotensinogen into angiotensin one, and angiotensin one goes to angiotensin two through um, angiotensin converting enzyme. So let's let's go back to the steps here. So number two. Renin gets produced. Uh, remember, when renin is produced, that ends up um, causing, again, through a lot of a lot of different things are going to happen. A lot of enzy enzymes are involved. A couple of enzymes are involved there. But you're going to produce angiotensin II throughout the whole body. That's going to circulate as a hormone, and that has a many many targets. But um, one of the really important targets is the smooth muscle on the efferent arterial, the smooth muscle also on the afferent arterial. Both of those, both of those are constricted by angiotensin II. And what happens is you have excess constriction, which means at that point, very low blood flow because you're uh, restricting that. And that turns into or translates to low filtration pressure and then inadequate filtration meaning you're, you're going to build up a bunch of things in the blood that are supposed to be removed by the kidney and go into the urine. So you'll have a buildup of serum creatinine, you'll have a buildup of blood urea nitrogen, nitrogen or BUN, a buildup of uremic toxins, so metabolic waste that is harmful to accumulate, such as um, indoxyl sulfate and many other things. Um, the main point is that you're you're accumulating things that you should not be, and they're detrimental to other parts of the body. 
So in summary, hepatorenal syndrome is a response to the body's systemic hypotension triggered by theft of blood, and that specifically would be the visceral abdominal arteries dilating, which then causes accumulation of blood in all those veins um, that are corresponding to those organs. Renal failure does occur in hepatorenal syndrome, but there's no structural damage. That means it would be wrong to say that the kidney is injured. It would be correct to say that the kidney is currently not functioning well uh, at that point because it is not receiving enough blood pressure. Um, that means we haven't damaged renal parenchyma or functional cells. That means that's, that should be reversible, okay? And that's due to the afferent arterial or vasoconstriction. Technically, that's called a pre-renal um, pre type of renal failure because it's, it, it is in the blood vessels, not in the renal cells themselves. Consequences of renal failure are numerous. Basically, uh, a lot of bad stuff accumulates in the blood. So that would be, um, again, all those uremic toxins, electrolytes, creatinine, and all those other things. Um, anything you could really think of that's normally filtered would not get filtered at that point uh, very well, and that creates many problems within the body. Um, so that wraps it up. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned a lot, and please um, feel free to comment if you have any questions, um, you know, critical feedback or anything. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Oh, <laughs>